all right? So the number of ways that I can arrange five books on a shelf is five times four times three times two times one. All right, does that sort of make sense to everybody? What if I had 15 books? What would that look like if I had 15, one five, 15 books to arrange on the shelf? What would that look like? You would just put a one in front of all those. Well, and then it would keep going, right? So it would be 15, if I were arranging all 15 on the shelf, it would be 15 times 14, times 13, times 12, 11, 10, 9, and on and on and on until I got down to my last book. If I were arranging all 15 books on the shelf. Does that make sense? Now, we all have calculators. We can type that in on our calculator. But when you're typing 15 times 14 times 13 all the way down, that takes a little while. And if you think about what if I had a hundred books? Well, that would be awful because that would take me forever just to type all those individual numbers in my calculator. Luckily, this magnificent machine has a shortcut for you. So here's what I'd like you to do. Let's go back to our first problem, which was five books. We all have our calculators. We're going to press five. Just press the number five. Then go to that math button that we use to change into fractions, just your regular math button. Click across the top menu till you get to probability. And in that big long list of stuff, you'll see an exclamation point. Click it and then press enter. And it gave you the 120. This right here, is called five factorial. When you start with a number and then multiply by each successive lower integer, that's called factorial. And the symbol for factorial is the exclamation point. So if I wanted to arrange 15 books on the shelf, I would press 15, and then math, over to prob, down to the exclamation point, which is factorial, and 15 factorial is a pretty big number, right? There's more decimal places than that. But do you see the E12 on the end of that? What does it mean when an E pops up in your answer? It means scientific notation. So this is a big giant number, 1.3 times 10 to the 12th. That's how many ways you could arrange 15 different books on a shelf. So when we get an E on our calculator, and we will get a lot of them in this unit, when we get an E, that means scientific notation. Make sure you record the number in scientific notation. In general, if you are arranging n things in a row, it's n factorial. So n or five books is five factorial, 15 books is 15 factorial. So let's look at question number two. What do you think about that? How many ways can nine people stand in a line? You just do a nine ex, ex, uh, factorial. That nine factorial, that's exactly right. Guys, you gotta see that there's no difference between five books on a shelf and nine people in a line. You're doing exactly the same thing. You're lining them up in a row. So if you are lining up n things in a row, it's n factorial, period. I don't care if they're books, people, dogs, it doesn't matter. If there's eight of them and you're lining up in a row, eight factorial, okay? 
So nine factorial, I can't remember what that number is. It's pretty big too. 362,880 is the answer to problem number two. Everybody all right? Now, question number three is slightly different because I have 10 um, people running the race, but not all 10 are going to get prizes. Only three of them are going to get prizes. So here are my prizes. That's what I'm choosing. I'm choosing who gets first prize, who gets second prize, and so on. So here are my prizes. <clears throat> How many choices do I have for first prize? Ten. Ten. I have ten choices for first prize. And then, how many choices will I have for second place? Nine. And then, for third place, so the answer is 720. For this problem, I can't just hit 10 factorial because 10 factorial would be used if they were all getting a prize, if I were lining them all up in a row. But I'm not, I'm only lining up three of them. So it's just 10 times nine times eight, and I'll enter those individually. All right, Mrs. Ford has eight jumpers and 10 shirts. How many outfits are possible? Think about choices. How many ways can I pick a jumper? Eight. And how many ways can I pick a shirt? Ten. Yep. So how many outfits do I have? Eight. Eighty. Perfect. Eight times ten. Now, Mr. Ford, he's got more clothes than I do. How many outfits does he have if he has to wear a sport coat, a shirt, and a pair of pants? How many outfits would he have? Is it 600? It is 600 because he can choose a sport coat five ways. He can pick a shirt 12 ways and he can pick a pair of pants 10 ways. So five times 12 times 10. How many ways can I arrange this home row of keys on the keyboard? These, these letters, how many ways can they be arranged on the keyboard? Is it the 362,000? It absolutely is. Because why? Because there's nine letters and exactly. they just have the factorial amount. You're absolutely right on. Thank you so much. How many letters are there? Nine. How many ways can I arrange nine things in a row? Nine factorial. Now be careful with number seven. Same idea, but a little bit different. How many ways can you answer 10 true false questions? Ideas? Is it 20? 20 ways? No, but you're on the right track. I understand where that came from. Here are the 10 questions. All right. How many choices? When you write these blanks out like this, you're talking about choices. How many choices do I have to answer the first question? Two. And how many question, ways do I have to answer the second question? Two. And two and two and two and two and two. And two. So Jacob, it's not two times 10, it's two to the 10th. Because it's two times two times two and so on. What if this were a multiple choice test and every question had four options. 
then it wouldn't be, it would be, it'd be four to the 10th. That's exactly right, because every question would have four options. Very, very good. How many ways can four different prizes be given out if there are 10 people in the contest? Come on, we already talked about this. We're giving out, we got 10 people, we're giving out four prizes. What's that look like? Seven. That's exactly right. And I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but you can type that right into your calculator and that would be the answer. You're awarding just four prizes. You got 10 choices for first, second, third, and fourth. Good job. Uh, 5,000 people. Okay, thank you. All right. Now we're going to do a license plate problem. We're actually going to do two of them. Nine and 10 are the same problem. And the first one, number nine, says that anything goes. You're going to build a license plate that has two letters followed by three digits. And the absolute only stipulation is the digits can't be zero. So how many letters can I pick from? How many choices do I have for my first position here? Twenty-six. Yep, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. Now, how many choices do I have for the second one? Be very careful. Don't say 25. You still have 26. Because if you are making a license plate, isn't it possible to have two letters that are the same in your license plate? Yeah. It absolutely is. All right, how many non-zero non digits are there? Digits are numbers. How many non-zero numbers are there? Single digit. Nine. Yep. And again, you're allowed to repeat. There's no stipulation in the problem that says your license plate can't have two fives. So that's the answer to question nine. 26 times 26, that takes care of my letters. And then 999 takes care of my digits. Now, how many plates are possible for number 10 where nothing can repeat? So it's the same format, it's still letter, letter, number, 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 but nothing can repeat. What do you think about that? Would you just say 26 times 25 times 9 times 8 times 7? That's exactly what you would do. Thank you very much. If you cannot use a letter or number that you've already used, then you have one less option. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, now we got a bunch of them that are all the same. Looks like 11, 12, 13, and 14 are all the same with just varying restrictions. So number 11 says, how many four letter call signs, and by call sign, they mean something like WIBC. You know, you, your favorite radio station or TV station, how it's identified with letters. So that's called a call sign. So W-I-B-C is a call sign. W-T-H-R. All right, so how many are possible if everything goes? If you're allowed to use any letter you want as many times as you want, how many call signs would be possible? I have no idea. Is that 26 times 26 times 26 times 26? Yep. That's the right answer then. Whatever 26 to the fourth, basically, is what you're doing. Whatever that is, that's the answer. Because there are no restrictions in problem number 11. 
Now, in problem 12, it says nothing can be repeated. Well, if nothing can be repeated, then what does this look like? 26 times 25 times 24 times 23. Exactly, exactly. And you can type that in. I, I, the setup is the critical part. I know you can type those numbers in on your calculator. Um, number 13, how many call signs are possible if no vowels are allowed? So the only restriction in problem number 13 is that you cannot use a vowel. What's that one going to look like? All 20, 21 times 21 times 21. Yep. We're going to go with the standard. The standard vowels are A, E, I, O, and U. Period. Those are our vowels. We're thinking about Jeopardy. Those are the vowels. So we're going to take 21 times 21 times 21 times 21. Now, what if, for number 14, what if you can't use a vowel and you can't repeat? Yeah, thank you so much for participating. I appreciate it. More than you know, thank you. All right, number 15, now we have a baseball problem. There are nine players on the baseball team. How many, assuming anybody can bat anywhere, how many batting orders are possible? What do you think? Is it the same as the other one where it's just uh, nine exclamation mark? Yep, let's say nine factorial. That's what it is. It's nine factorial. Okay. Because when I arrange nine players in a row, I'm just lining them up. And I can arrange nine guys, girls, dogs, books, nine things in a row, nine factorial ways. So that's the answer to number 15. Now, number 16 says, same question. I still have my nine guys doing my batting order, but the pitcher has to bat last. Now, if the pitcher has to bat last, then I only have one choice for that spot. Would everybody agree with me? The pitcher goes there. Now, how many people do I have to choose from to get my first batter? Eight. Yep, and then down the line. Now, this may, oops, I think I left something out. This may look a little different because of the double one on the end, but isn't that just eight factorial? And doesn't that make sense? If you pull the pitcher out and say, you're going last, then aren't you arranging eight people? Yep, eight factorial. All right, what if the pitcher is last and the best hitter is third? So the pitcher's still last and now the best hitter is third. So there's one choice here and one choice here. What's the rest of this going to look like? Seven. And that, while it is kind of jumbled up, that is seven factorial. Because if you pull out the pitcher and the best batter, then what you're really doing is arranging the other seven. So that, if you multiplied it all together, that would amount to seven factorial. All right, number 18. I am gonna make one digit, two digit, and three digit numbers. 
four, from the digits one, two, three, four, five, and six. So in other words, you're going to build numbers and you're not allowed to use seven, eight, nine, and zero. You're only allowed to use the digits one through six. Okay? And the numbers you build can have one digit, two digits, or three digits. Alrighty, so here we go. How many one digit numbers would be possible in this scenario? Six. Yeah, six. Anywhere the six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There you go, six of them. Now, what about two digit numbers? Two digit numbers that can only contain one, two, three, four, five, and six. How many of those would there be? Two. That's a good guess. I understand it. It's not quite right. Would it be 36? It would be 36. Because when you build a two digit number from our pile of possibilities, you have six choices for the first digit and six choices for the second digit. Don't say six and five. It would only be six and five if no digits were allowed to repeat. But it doesn't tell me that, so I make no assumptions. So there's 36 two-digit numbers. All right, what about three-digit numbers? How many of those could I make? Uh, six cubed. Yep, six times six times six, which is 216. That's exactly right. Now, what do I do with each of these scenarios? Now, the question said, how many total numbers could I build? What do you think I'm going to do with these three? Add them. Add them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. There are going to be times when you are going to start feeling, you're going to, you're going to let yourself get confused. When do I add? When do I multiply? If you are building one-digit numbers or two digits or three digits, you add. You add. To get the total number, you add. So I'm going to add all these up. And what do I get? Is it 258? Double check my arithmetic there. I think that's right. 258 different numbers. When you are doing two things at the same time, when you are picking a number and a number and a number, you multiply. And is multiply or is add. All right, I've got this word Chevy. How many ways can I arrange the word, the letters, excuse me, the letters of the word Chevy? Somebody tell me. Please. Five factorial. Yes! Why? Because there are five of them and I am arranging them in a row next to each other. That's five factorial. How about the word precal? Six factorial? Yes, perfect. Six factorial. Now, I'm going to skip down. I'm going to skip a couple. We'll come back to them. Go down to 23. How many ways can I arrange the letters of pre-calculus? Now, does anybody notice anything different about this word? The first two words I did... There's repeating letters. Exactly. Now, listen to me. There's repeating letters. Okay? Here's how you handle anything that repeats. Whether it's duplicate beads on a necklace, whether it's duplicate coins, what any duplicate, anything that's called an indistinguishable repetition. So it's indistinguishable. Every C looks the same. Every E looks the same. They're indistinguishable. I got 11 letters. I start with 11 factorial. Just like I did five letters and just like I did six letters. You start with your total letters factorial. Then, there's two C's. 
So I'm going to put a Q factorial in the denominator. So my 11 factorial, that's my total letters, are going to be divided by my repetitions. So I've got two C's. I've got two L's. So I divide by another two factorial. And I've got two U's. Divide by another two factorial. Now, did I get all my repeated letters? Yes. When you type this into your calculator, make sure that since you have, since you have more than one thing in the denominator, make sure you're putting it in parentheses. There is no way to simplify factorials multiplied together, so please don't even try. You're going to type 11 math prob factorial divided by parentheses to math prob factorial times 2 math Prob factorial times two math prob factorial. And before you dare whine about how many buttons you have to press, I want to remind you that when I was your age, I was doing this by hand. So just be grateful that you've got a button on your calculator that will do it. Hopefully you got 4,989,600 as your answer. Now, any question about that? You understand what I did there? All right, then I want you to try the next one, number 24. You do Mississippi. Set it up and then share your answer with me. Did I get it right? Did I count right and divide right? I got that. Super. Anybody not get that and have a question? Here's my setup. There were four S's, four I's, and two P's, I think I counted. I didn't get that correct, but I understand why I didn't get it correct. Okay. So, so uh, I made the mistake of repeating like uh, two uh, factorial five times instead of just doing four factorial. Oh, four factorial yeah, so. yeah. No, however many repeated letters you have of each kind, so four S's would be four factorial. Two P's is two factorial. All right, everybody else okay? You good? All right. So let's back up and get, grab number 21. How many social security numbers are possible if all arrangements are possible? So remember what a social security number looks like. And I don't know what the real restrictions are. I mean, I'm sure there are some real restrictions. We're ignoring all that. And we're just saying, how many, what is the maximum number of social security numbers you could have in that format. 
Anybody have a thought on that? Would it just be non-factorial? Um, no, but I understand. I understand where that's coming from. I want you to stop and think about building this number. You're going to make a social security number for some, someone. How many, given no restrictions at all, no restrictions, how many digits do you have available to you to put in this first spot? Nine. Actually, there's 10. I think in reality, there might only be nine. I don't know if we can use zero to start the number, but again, we don't know the rules. So we're just saying the maximum number given no restrictions would be 10. You can put any digit you want here. And then any digit here, 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 and here. We're saying no restrictions. Be careful with the use of factorial because what factorial means is once you've used it, you can't use it again. And there was nothing like that mentioned in this problem. My I have social a question. Uh huh. So there's nine spaces up there, but we used ten. Because you have ten choices for each space. There are ten digits, zero through nine, and you are picking a digit to put in this spot. There's ten choices for each of these spots. I can pick an eight and a seven and a three and an eight and an eight and a seven and a zero and a five and a seven. I have, and when I pick a number, I have 10 choices. Those blanks represent choices. All right, thank you. So I don't know what that is, 10 to the, um, one, two, three, four, 10 to the ninth. All right. Uh, how many telephone numbers are possible in the 317 area code? So most of you have a phone number. You got 317, then three digits, and then four digits. So again, no restrictions whatsoever. And I have a feeling that the phone company has some, but I don't know what they are. So you're just going with no restrictions at all. How many phone numbers would be possible? To the seven. Exactly. 10 to the 7. And if you guys pay attention to the news, you, you were young, but you maybe still know. A few years ago, they added a new area code to Indiana. Indiana got a new area code. Anybody have any idea why they needed to do that? They absolutely needed to do it. Why? Because as soon as you get more than 10 to the 7th numbers, people start having the same phone number. So how do you fix it? You give them a new area code. That's what they did. All right, next we have, um, how many students, or no, wait a second. How do I know that at Cathedral High School right now, there have to be at least two kids with the same first and last initial? Now, I'm not saying that somebody matches you exactly. I'm saying there have to be two people out there that match. How do I know that with absolute certainty? Is it because like with all possibilities, like letters can repeat with each other? Well, with, yes, exactly. If I'm picking a first and last initial, if I, if I allow every single letter, so even X's and Z's and Q's, even you know, every possible letter, there would only be this many first and last initial combinations. Would you agree with me? If I'm only doing first and last initial? Well, that's 676 possibilities. How many kids are at Cathedral? More than 676, right? So somebody matches. 
Again, I'm not saying that there's another LF. I'm not being specific. I'm just saying because there's only 676 possibilities in a student body that's almost double that, there have to be some matches. All right. Uh, where am I? All right, now we need to look at 26 very carefully. I want you to read number 26, part A and part B. Are they the same Are they the same problem, just worded differently, or are they different problems? Both of them involve 20 kids and choosing two of them. So what do you think? Are they the same problem, A and B? Yes. Okay, anybody else want to share a thought? Agree with that or disagree with that? I think yes. All right, let's talk about it here for a second. I'd like you to think about it for a minute. Let's suppose, I'm sitting here looking at all your little faces. Well, not all of them, because I don't see Brenda. Lori's screen is off. I don't see anything but George's ear. But let's say I'm looking at my screen here, and I see all your faces, most of them anyway. And I'm going to pick a president and a vice president. So I'm going to pick Rory's going to be president, and David's going to be vice president. Is that? the same as picking David as president and Rory as vice president. No, those are different things, aren't they? So in problem A, make sure I got my problems right, yeah. In problem A, order matters. Who I pick first matters because whoever I pick first is the president. And the other person is the vice president. In question B, there is no order. Because if you're going to be a governing council, then the order I pick you doesn't matter. I got two people on my leadership team. Doesn't matter who came first. They're both the leadership team. Do you see the difference now between the problems? All right. Now, when order matters, we have what we call a permutation. I don't know if you've ever heard that word or not, but when someone talks about permutations, they're talking about arrangements. They're talking about putting people or putting something in order. The notation we use for this is either P with a 20 in front of it and a 2 after it, standing for 20 total, pick two, order matters. And sometimes that's written like this. I will probably use both notations or as you start looking at the review materials that have accumulated over the years, you'll see both notations. They mean exactly the same thing. Now let's get our calculators out. Let's type in 20. And then let's go to where our factorial is. So math, click across the prob, and in that column, do you see an NPR option? Pick it, type two, and there are 380 ways to do problem A. 380 ways to pick a president and a vice president out of a class of 20. Now, when order doesn't matter, that's called a combination. And that is written the same way, but we use a C. So 20, math, prob, and CR, and that's 190. 
Now, will you read question number 27? And tell me what you think about these two questions. Are they the same or are they different? Question number 27. We've got 13 kids and we're choosing four. second one is permutation. Exactly. They're the different. The first one is combination. Exactly. Guys, does everybody see they're different? In 13, excuse me, in 27A, I'm picking four people. And the order that I choose them doesn't matter. I just need a combination of 13 people taken four at a time. This 13 tells me how many I have to choose from. This tells me how many I'm choosing. And this tells me I don't care what order I get them. But if I'm assigning them specific tasks, then order does matter. And it's 13 P4. Now, later on, I'm going to show you how to calculate these by hand because once in a while we run into something where they use letters instead of numbers and you have to be able to, to calculate that and your calculator won't do it. So we're going, to, we're going to learn those little formulas later. But what I want to make sure right now is that everybody sees the difference between problem A and problem B. In problem A, everybody's getting the same job. If everybody's getting the same job, then the order I choose doesn't matter. In problem B, everybody's getting different jobs, so the order does matter. All right, all right, on here, question 28. Now, let's see who's been paying attention. How many ways can I arrange eight people on a log? Eight factorial. Yes, indeed. If you're arranging eight people in a row, it's eight factorial, period. When you arrange them in a circle, however, it's one less factorial because of the rotational aspect of a circle. So if I have eight people around a campfire, that's seven factorial. Eight people around a campfire would be seven factorial. If anybody is interested in getting the logic behind that, I will be happy to go through that in office hours if you're wondering why that is. But it has to do with the fact the circles don't have a beginning and an end. So as you rotate the circle, it's the same arrangement, even though it looks different when you write it down. So, bottom line. N people in a row, N factorial. N people in a circle, N minus one factorial. So, how many ways can 10 people be seated around a round circular table? Nine Bingo. Easy, easy, easy. Number 30. How many ways can six keys be arranged on a key ring? Five factorial. Yes, except there's another piece to this. These problems can get very complicated, so I'm trying to hit the highlights as we go. Let me stop and recap. N people in a row, N factorial. N people in a circle, N minus one factorial. Okay? If you have repetitions, duplicates, you divide by the duplicates factorial like we did with our letters. Now what makes the key ring problem different? 
Well, I don't want to do it with six keys, but let's suppose, I'm going to do it with three because that's easier for me to draw. Let's suppose I have, well, I can do six, I guess. I'll go ahead and do six, and they're different colors. So I have a green key and a yellow key and a blue key and an orange key and a purple key and a black. I don't know, I didn't really use it. Oh, what's another color? White. All right. So there are my six keys and I'm arranging those and I can do that five factorial ways because they're in a circle. Okay. So one of those ways, and I'm certainly not going to write out you know, all the 120 different ways. But one of those ways would look like this. Would you agree with that? That one of the ways would look like that? Okay, so let's suppose I have this key ring right here in my hand. It's laying right here in my hand and they're laid out just like that. Okay, when I take that key ring and I pop it over into this hand. So it's laying here in my hand. I pop it over into this hand. Isn't this what I see? Did I physically rearrange any of the keys? What did I do? I looked at it from the other side. That's called a reflection. And reflections occur only with hand held circular permutations, arrangements. So everybody got, when I said I'm going to put six keys on a key ring, everybody got that there'd be five factorial ways to arrange those keys, one less. But since this problem involves something that I can hold in my hand and look at from both sides without doing any rearrangement. I can't count both of those. Those are the same arrangement. These are the same. So I have to divide by two. I only can take half of my arrangements. Now, I did not do that with problem 29 because in problem 29, I was arranging people around a table. I cannot, first of all, I can't hold that table in my hand. There's no way I can look at it from the other side. You only worry about reflections if it's a circle that you can hold in your hand. So quite honestly, kids, this isn't even included in a lot of books because it's very limited. What are some circular things you can hold in your hand? Besides a key ring. Bracelet. Bracelet. A watch. Well, yeah, we won't be we wouldn't be arranging things on a watch probably, but I, it would be a handheld circular permutation. Basically, it's key rings, bracelets, and necklaces. That's about it that you're gonna worry about these reflections for. So the answer to that problem is five factorial over two. Five factorial over two. All right, we're gonna get through a couple more problems and then we're gonna go to lunch. These get a little bit hairy. I want you to remember all the things we've talked about and let's see if we can figure it out. All right, how many necklaces can be made from all right, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six keys. And A says there is a clasp. Oh, Lord, what does that mean? And B says there's no clasp. What in the heck is the difference? Can anybody think about what the difference is? Don't you have to, like, incorporate it so there's, like, an order? Okay, that is a great way to think about that, Grace, um, that the clasp functions as an additional bead, basically. So I might have six beads, but with a clasp, that would make seven. 
Making a necklace would be a circle, so it's six factorial divided by two because of the reflections. Now, I like your thought process, Grace. Personally, I think about it like this. What does a clasp on a necklace do? You undo the clasp, what does it turn that necklace into? It's a line. It becomes a line. So six things would be six factorial. But you can think about it like you did. It's a circle, but it has one additional bead. So when I drop it down one, I'm still at six factorial divided by two. Now, what if it doesn't have a clasp? What would that be with no clasp? Would it just be six factorial? Nope, it'd be five factorial divided by two. Let's talk about that. I know it's confusing. There's so much to remember. If you're arranging in a circle, it's one less factorial. So if you have six beads and you're putting them in a circle, it's five factorial. Every handheld circular permutation, necklace, bracelet, key ring, gets divided by two. So with a clasp, it's six factorial divided by two. Without a clasp, it's one less five factorial divided by two. All right. Let's look at the next one. Yeah, this will be our last one. We'll stop with 32. All right, so what have we got? Uh, how many beads? Two, five, six, 10, 11, 12. Did I count right? I've got 12 beads. Yeah. All right. Now, let's just start where we were a minute ago. I'm putting these beads in a necklace. With a clasp would be 12 factorial divided by 2. Without a clasp would be 11 factorial divided by 2. Now that's the beginning. I am not done. What is different about these 12 beads that I have to think about? There's a repeating component. They're repeating. And how do I handle repeating? I'm going to put more stuff in my denominator, right? Two blues, three yellows, four oranges. Same over here. Oops. Two blues, three yellows, four oranges. When you have duplicates in any problem. I don't care what it is. Books on a shelf, coins in a row, beads on a necklace, letters in a word. When you have duplicates, you divide by them factorial. The clasp makes it 12 factorial. No clasp makes it 11 factorial. Any necklace, bracelet, or keychain is getting divided by two. These are the duplicates. All right, let's type them in, see what we come up with as our answer, and then we will be done for the day. Well, done with this class for the day. Anybody agree or disagree with my calculations? I think that's fine. That's what everybody got? 
All right, we've hit on some really big ideas today, kids, and we have some more um, to hit on. We'll finish this lesson tomorrow, uh, 9.1, so that homework will be due Thursday. Remember, if you have questions, concerns, office hours will be Wednesday and Friday of this week, okay? All right, have a great day, guys. I'll see ya. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.